of the word. My name is Connie Winter and I'll be reading from Luke 2, 21 through 23. At the end of eight days when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what he said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons. Good morning, church family. It's good to be back with you this morning, and uh, you know, we just had uh, Thanksgiving, which has always been for me, uh, when I think about just like national holidays that we celebrate as a country, just what a blessing to have a holiday like that, where the pure intention of the day, outside of stuffing yourself with food, is to actually pause, as Abraham Lincoln said in his address, is to pause and to give thanks to God the Almighty for what he has done for us and, and for our country. And as the people of God, um, we don't just have one day a year for Thanksgiving, do we? Uh, really, every day, we can stop and ponder and consider the great things the Lord has done and, and give thanks to him. And part of what we do every Sunday morning is just that. We gather in this place to praise God for who he is and what he has, has done. And, uh, and so I hope you had a, a sweet Thanksgiving with uh, your family or friends or however you celebrated. And now I pray that God will give us a sweet time in his word. I do have to ask though a question to help me understand my church family a little bit better. I think I know where my own family stands uh, on this. So we celebrated Thanksgiving. Um, one of the things that we're big about here at the church is we talk about being a church family. And yes, uh, we have worship and there are people up here leading us in worship. And yes, uh, I preach and I'm up here communicating to you, but this is not a show. Uh, we're not here to just simply to watch, but to participate in the singing ourselves and then in the receiving the word. And now I want you to participate by actually doing something. I want to find out where you stand on this as a church family. All right, by a show of hands, who here believes it's acceptable to decorate for Christmas before Thanksgiving? <laughs> oh boy, I think I know where this is going. Who here believes it's unacceptable and only decorate after Thanksgiving? Okay, all right, all right, well, there we go. Now, we can love one another as Christ loved us, right? So wherever you fall on that, be kind and gentle. Now, here's the interesting thing. For us as a church, um, while now we are technically in the Christmas season, if you've been with us throughout the fall, we've actually been quote unquote in the Christmas season since the beginning of the fall because we started our study in the Gospel of Luke and we've been walking through Luke's Gospel looking at the life of Jesus Christ. And it was actually about three weeks ago that when we were together, we were in Luke chapter two and we looked at the birth narrative. As Luke tells it, he tells us here in Luke chapter 2 how the birth of Jesus Christ uh, came about at the start of, of Luke chapter 2. So in reality, we started our Christmas celebrations before Thanksgiving, all right, as a church. So however you fall on that. But I've been enjoying looking at the birth of Jesus before the Christmas season, kind of removing it from the tradition and nostalgia, because you just see things a little bit different. And one of the things that sta stood out to me as we were going through the birth narrative and the start of Luke chapter 2 was this fact. When you look at how Luke describes Jesus' birth in verses 1 through 7, Luke just calls it like he sees it. There's nothing really spectacular that surrounds the birth and delivery of Jesus as it happens. Jesus was born to teenage parents in a very humble way. There are no angels showing up at his delivery. That's going to happen later on. But, but Luke records it and he says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea. He was born to Mary and Joseph in a very humble place. But then it's after his birth that we begin to see the supernatural enter in because while his birth takes place in a very humble way, an angel goes and he visits shepherds who are out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And we saw how when the angel appears to the shepherds, he makes this huge proclamation that gets lost in the Christmas season all too often. He says, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for, anybody remember how many people? All people. I mean, that's a huge proclamation, right? To say that something is good news for everybody would mean that they have to touch everybody's life. And he says, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a 
Savior who is Christ the Lord. And there's the bold proclamation. Why it's good news is because a Savior has been born. And the only reason that it can be good news for all people is if all people need what? Saving. And so there's the big proclamation. Does humanity know that it needs to be rescued? Does humanity know that it needs to be saved? The angel says yes, because this is good news for all people, because you all need saving, and that Savior has been born. But then he tells us why this one who's born in Bethlehem is able to be that Savior. And he says there's two reasons why. First, he says, for he is Christ. He has the position. He is the anointed one. He is the Messiah. That's what Christ means. For, for those of you that maybe haven't been around church a lot, you've heard the name Jesus Christ, and maybe not in a worshipful way, right? That's not, his, that's not his full name. Christ is identifying him as the anointed one, as the one whom God has chosen to be the Savior. So he's got the position because he's God's chosen one to save, but then he also has the power to save. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ, and then he says it, the Lord. He's got the power because he's God himself come down. That word for Lord, as we talked about, doesn't just simply mean master. It can mean that, but when the New Testament authors in reference to Jesus are talking about him as Lord, they're using that word to continually refer to him as Yahweh. The Old Testament translation of, or the Old Testament, it calls him Yahweh. In the New Testament, we see Jesus referred to as Lord. He is This baby who's born, make no mistake, the big proclamation of the angel is that he is the Savior, he is God, and he is the anointed one who has come to save. So when we come to Christmas time, and when you begin hearing people singing songs or singing carols and there's stuff about Jesus, like we know from what God's word says, the true identity of this child and who he is, and and the shepherds show us that there's only one appropriate response when you hear this good news. It's interesting, the angel doesn't command them to do it, but it says they immediately went to Bethlehem to see this thing that the angels had told them about. And they found the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, just like the angel had said, and they told Mary, and they told Joseph, and all who were there, just what they had heard. And then they left worshiping him. When you encounter Jesus, when you know him for who he is, it, you, you can't help but worship him, give thanks to God for him, and you can't help but tell others about him. And today I want to add to this, because as we make our way through the life of Jesus, we're not done yet with his infancy. In fact, the things that happen here, both that we're going to look at this week and next week, are rarely talked about around Christmas, but they all are events that take place in and around his infancy, and they just add to the the majesty and the grandeur of who Christ is for for us and for the world. And so I just want to look at today just really four verses. We're going to look at Luke 21 through 24. It's going to also serve then as the backdrop to the message next week. But, but let's dive in. Let's, let's look at where the, the text of the narrative goes next. It says this. It says this. And at the end of eight days, so that is eight days after the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So Jesus' birth narrative, it continues on. We see the angels talking to the shepherds, the shepherds going to Bethlehem. And then while Mary and Joseph are still in Bethlehem, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, <clears throat> eight days later, they come and they do something. They both name and they circumcise Jesus. And we're going to get to the circumcision here in just a moment. But the first thing I want us to consider from this one little verse, it's really easy to read past and move on that there's some really profound things here that are said to us. And the first thing I want to highlight, and it's not the major theme of this text, but it helps to, to set it up for us, is that Joseph and Mary, look at what this text tells us about them, were obedient to and believed God's word. The theme that's going to be throughout this message today is the obedience of Joseph and Mary. But the things that they do in obedience to God and to his word, how it it ultimately helps us better understand Jesus and who he is and what he came to do. We, We see their obedience first on display in when it says, on the eighth day, they came and circumcised Jesus. But what I want to focus on is that they gave him the name what? Jesus. On the eighth day, they named him Jesus. Now, the fact that they named him on the eighth day isn't where we see their obedience to God or belief in God's word. As we saw, if you were with us when we were looking at the birth narrative of John the Baptist, 
His parents named John on the eighth day. It was a tradition. It wasn't required by Old Testament law to name your child on the eighth day. But where we see their obedience is that they gave him the name Jesus. And them giving him the name Jesus was no small thing. The angel had come to Mary, we saw in Luke verses 30 and 31, and said in Luke 31, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And then in Matthew's gospel, when the angel appears to Joseph in a dream, not only is Mary, Jesus' earthly mother, told this, but his earthly father is told this, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name what? Jesus, both Mary and Joseph were instructed, nay, commanded by God, that the baby that, that they would have as their own was to be called Jesus. And what Luke 21 does is it delivers on that command. It shows us that both Mary and Joseph believed God's word and obeyed it by naming him Jesus. Now, just so that you know, this was a strange thing in Jesus' day. The firstborn boy that was born into a Jewish household was named after his father. In fact, in the narrative of John's birth, when he was born and his mother said that they were going to call him John, everybody's like, wait a sec, wait a sec, we got to ask the husband, is that the right thing, Zechariah? Do you want him named John? Because that wasn't the tradition. Culturally, you named your son after the father. And so what they were doing here is they're, they're bucking, they're, they're going against tradition. Now, Today, that's not necessarily as big of a deal. Back then, that was a big thing. It was kind of weird to name your child that way. Like in our family, most people don't know this. My dad's name is Albert John Wojnicki. Now, and his dad's name is Albert John Wojnicki. And his dad's name is Albert John Wojnicki. So my dad is technically Albert John Wojnicki III. And when my brother was born... The firstborn son of my, my parents, he was born, and, uh, and on the day that he was born, my dad calls up his dad, and he says, Dad, he says, I've, I've had a son. In fact, here, let me show you a little picture here. This was actually, um, okay, this is actually at my brother Todd's baptism. I didn't, I, didn't, I forgot about this. He was actually baptized into the Roman Catholic Church, so I don't know, Todd, you're, you're more special or something. I don't get it, but... So there are my folks. Look at my, they were like 19, I think, in this picture. So, so there's, little, there's, there's my brother. So, so my, my dad calls up my grandfather and says, hey, dad, we had a son. And he's like, oh, great. What's his name? To which my dad says, we named him Todd Gabriel Wojnicki. To which my grandfather said, for editing purposes, he said, what the blank kind of a name is Todd Gabriel Wojnicki? You, you had one job, you know, Albert John, Albert John, Albert John, Todd Gabriel, right? So like my grandfather was a bit offended. I think they appeased him by baptizing him in the Roman Catholic Church, and, uh, but that didn't stick. Um, and, uh, and so, so like, yes, like it can be awkward, right? Your father can be upset with you for not, but back then it was more, It was a culturally bizarre thing to not do this. But what did Joseph and Mary do? They were obedient and they believed God's word and they named him Jesus. They pushed aside tradition. They pushed aside cultural preferences. They said, God called us to do this and we're going to do it. Now, church, that can seem like a small thing. But can we really be honest with one another? Do not at times cultural, familial, external pressures sometimes make it difficult for us to seek to obey what God wants us to do. Sometimes when we are called to obey God, can it make us seem awkward like naming a child Todd Gabriel Wojnicki rather than, right? Like there are things that culture can put upon you, certain pressures that it can be easier just to, because it's right in front of you. And, and I want to talk to the parents here for just a moment. Like, If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and when I look at Mary and Joseph, and by the way, this is like a side note. This is not the main part of what this story is, but but we just, we look at parents obeying God in regards to their children. And I think one, it's a commendable thing because it's honoring to God, but I think it also gives encouragement to us. My prayer for you as parents is that you face the cultural pressures 
the traditions that come up in society that potentially go against what God has called you to do in the raising of your sons and your daughters. That, that God would give you by his spirit such assurance, such confidence in, in who he is for you that, that if and when culture's telling you to do one thing in, with your children and you know it goes against the word of God, that you'd be able to stand up and you'd be able to say, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And, 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 and I hope that we would be praying for one another as a church in that. And for the more aged of our church, that as you look at the younger generation, that you would be praying for those who are now walking the path that you one time walked, because it at times is not easy. And when you see someone in our church family who you know is standing up and striving to raise their children in that way, by the way, parents, you can't control how your kids are going to turn out, right? That's not on you. You can't control that outcome. But, but what you can control is what you are going to choose to do in serving them. And so I just, I love seeing Joseph and Mary's obedience and belief in God's word because it's what he calls us to as well. But, but we see their obedience to and belief in God's word, not just in the naming of Jesus. We see it in the second thing. And this is where we're going to spend a little bit of time this morning. We see it in the circumcision of Jesus. We see it in the circumcision of Jesus. In the text, it says that not only did they name him on the eighth day, but when the eighth day came, they went to, to circumcise Jesus. And by the way, this wasn't taking place in the temple. We're going to get to that, that later. This is just an act that was done most likely in the home. And it was something that was required literally of every Jewish male. Leviticus 12, 3 says, And on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. This wasn't a suggestion that you did this with your child. This was a command of God that if you were obedient Jew, you circumcised your boy. It didn't matter if they were the firstborn, secondborn, thirdborn, whatever. Circumcision is what you did to your child. Now, without being too detailed on this, because this isn't something that's talked about a lot, like when you hear in the scriptures that someone is called to be circumcised, what is it? Well, we see it kind of described here in the, in the text. Circumcision is the act of cutting off the foreskin of the male reproductive organ. And so this is what God called his people to do to their male descendants. And I want you to notice something. Did you see how it says that it was done on the eighth day? Like today, if you, if you have this done to your child, typically you do it right in the hospital and it's right away. But the eighth day, a lot of people have wondered, like, why the eighth day? And there's some different thoughts on that. But one of the things that we do know is medically speaking, in God's kindness and in his wisdom, the male body by the eighth day after birth has produced, has the chemical uh, compound makeup to be able to coagulate blood. And so when the surgery is performed, uh, ultimately the blood's able to coagulate and they wouldn't, they wouldn't bleed to death. So it's just kind of a little fascinating thing that we look at. But the point of this is though, it's like, this is what God called people to do. It was, it was, a, it was a bloody thing. When you think about it, it was an unpleasant thing. By the way, um, because it was so important and we're going to get to this in, in just a minute. When you did it in Jewish tradition, typically you had to have 10 witnesses present. 10 witnesses present. So this wasn't something kind of done in the privacy. This was kind of like a, a party that you invite, invite people over. I'm like, no, thank you. No, thank you. But, but I'll explain why in just a minute. So when you know this, though, I, I mean, have you ever thought? I know that you probably have. If you've ever read this and you know it's circumcision, why did God command this? <laughs> What is going on with this? And then, to me, the bigger question, why did God himself allow himself to experience this when he took on human form? Have you ever considered that? I just described to you what it is. God came down as a human baby. That in and of itself is a tremendous amount of humility. And then to consider this act which I just described, that God, as a human being, allowed someone to perform this on him, to go through with this thing. I mean, let's just stop, like, you know, Merry Christmas, everybody. We're talking about circumcision, all right? You know, like, have you ever considered, because here's the deal. 
It's all over the Bible. It's talked about throughout the Old Testament. It's significant in the Old Testament. The New Testament writers pick it up, yet, yet we don't take time to actually maybe ponder and consider what is the significance of this act that, that God called his people to do, let alone why Jesus Christ himself took on this sign in his, in his body. And so I want to just talk about it because when you begin to understand it, you begin to understand the significance of not just Mary and Joseph's obedience, but why Jesus did what he did. You see, the first time that circumcision is mentioned is in Genesis 17. In Genesis 17, verse 9, it says this, And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and me and you, and your offspring after you. And the covenant that he's talking about is this covenant where God said, I'm going to bless all the nations through you. You will be, Abraham, and your descendants will be my chosen people. You will be the ones through whom the promise of redemption comes. And then he says, as a sign of that covenant, what will you do? Every male you shall Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. That's the first time it shows up, is right here. And what do we learn about circumcision? Well, the very first thing we could say is circumcision was the sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham. It was something that every male descendant of Abraham would carry in their flesh as a sign to them of the covenant that God had made. The covenant that was that you will be my people and through you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Every male would receive this act done to them and they would carry in their flesh, he says, literally, the mark of of the covenant. So at minimum, it was a reminder to them of the, of the covenant that God had made with Abraham. But we come to it though, like, why? Why this sign? I can think of a lot of other things that would help me remember the covenant, you know, like, can we get a tattoo, pass a family ring along? Like, I, if there are other things, can we just be straightforward? Like, why this of all the rituals that you could, could do? Well, later on in Genesis 17, and we're going to see the next reason why, and I believe it's this, circumcision ser served to show the importance of complete obedience to God. Circumcision, boy, that's a tongue twister, right? Yeah, circumcision served to show the importance of complete obedience to God. Being straightforward, this was not a pleasant activity. This was something that that when done was in fact bloody and was in fact painful. And yet as God marks that as a covenant that they would carry with them in their flesh, the text goes on to say in Genesis 17, 13 and 14 something very important. He says this, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised so shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has, what? Broken my covenant. I could see how there would be a temptation because of what the nature of this act was to say, is this really significant? Is this really important to do? And God says, you want to know how important it is, how, how significant my covenant is, and that you are set aside for me, and that you remain obedient to me fully? If you do not do this, circumcise your child. You want to know how important full and complete obedience is to me? If you do not do this, you who fail to circumcise your son will be cut off and your descendants will be cut off. I will not consider you to be a part of my people. You see, God's not interested in partial obedience. He's interested in full and complete obedience. In fact, there's this really bizarre story. I don't have time to fully get into it in Exodus 4, 25 through 26. It's a story of when Moses... This is all after Abraham. Moses is called to deliver the people up and out of Egypt. And God sends him to do this task. And yet, all of a sudden, God comes to him and, and he's like, I'm going to take your life from you. 
I'm gonna kill you, I'm gonna cut you off. And you're like, why? He called Moses to, to rescue and redeem the people. Why is he now saying I'm gonna kill and cut you off? And it was because Moses had not yet circumcised his son. And so his wife goes and circumcises their son and then throws the foreskin at Moses' feet and says, I'm a bridegroom of blood. Look at what I had to do for, for you. This is something you should have done because God has called you to deliver the Egyptians, yet you have not given to your own son the sign of the covenant, which you knew that God said, if you don't do this, you'd be cut off. How can you be partially obedient to God when God requires what? Full and complete obedience. There's a, a story, just to, to lighten it for a moment here, of, of a man by the name of uh, John Kenneth uh, Galbraith. He was a teacher, ambassador, uh, author, and um, he had a, a housemaid that took care of the, the house for him. And he was, he was alive back in the um, 50s and 60s, and uh, he told his maid, he said, listen, I'm going to go take a nap. I'm really, really tired. I'm not feeling well. Don't interrupt me until I wake up from the nap. Well, as it would happen, he tells this story in his autobiography. The phone rang, and it was Lyndon B. Johnson calling from the White House. He wanted to talk to John. And here's the interaction that took place. He said, hi, this is President Johnson. I'd like to speak with, with John, please. And he said, uh, he's sleeping, Mr. President. He said not to be disturbed. To which the president said, well, wake him. I want to talk to him. To which the maid said, no, Mr. President, I work for him, not you. <laughs> now, partial or full obedience? It's full obedience. It doesn't matter that the President of the United States is calling me. Uh, my boss has said not to wake him. Now, here's the interesting thing. Uh, he said later, when he woke up and he called the president, rather than being upset, the president said, tell that woman I want to get her here to serve me in the White House. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This, when God calls upon his people to do this, one of the things we can say about this act of circumcision was it was designed to show the people the importance of complete obedience to them. Um, now, later on, by the way, if you read the Old Testament, you're going to see that this gets the people of Israel into trouble. Because while they would circumcise their children, um, they would do what God called them to do. They thought that they were in with God just because they were circumcised. And yet, that was only one area where they were obeying externally, but their hearts were far from the Lord. So, so it wasn't as though circumcision meant that you were in. It was just one aspect of obedience, and God calls them out later for, for that. In fact, this is really the next thing that we know about circumcision. Circumcision served as a reminder of the need for cleansing from the depravity of sin. Circumcision not only served as a reminder of the of, of full obedience to God that was required, but also served to remind them of the need for the cleansing of their lives because of their disobedience, because nobody can obey fully. Sure, you might obey in the circumcision of your child, but there were so many other things in which the people of God fell short, and circumcision reminded them of the need for the cleansing from the depravity of, of sin. Now look, in the ancient world, that part of the male anatomy... Back then, and even as science shows us say, it was, it was equated with uncleanliness. It just was. And so God, in calling upon his people to cut that part off and to literally throw it to the side, was, was indicating to them the need to, to have our own cleansing that would take place place, that, that they own, the own impure parts of us that would have to be cut out and removed in order for God to save and redeem us. And, and unless you don't think that that's what God intended, he clearly says it later on. Look at Jeremiah 4.4. 4. In Jeremiah 4.4, 4, God uses circumcision to make this very point. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Well, he's talking to people who have already been physically circumcised. So what's he talking about? Remove the foreskin of your hearts, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like burn, like a fire and burn with none to quench it because of the, your evil deeds. He says, your hearts have part of you that needs to be, to be cut off. So circumcision was this, was this visible picture to them that when they came into the world, they were born as sinners and, and they needed some outside external force to do a cleansing for them. And this is what he speaks to them through the prophet Jeremiah. But even before Jeremiah said it in Deuteronomy 36, the Lord said it there as well. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart 
and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may what? Live. This act of circumcision was continually reminding the people every time they performed it of the need for their hearts to be cleansed, be that, that sin resided in them and it needed to be cut off and it needed to be removed. They knew and they understood that circumcision did not make them right with God, but that it pointed to the need for God to do a work in him and in them. You know, I think about this, you know, when you give birth to a child and you're holding that baby for, for, for God's people, what a joyous thing for any of us. When a baby is born into the world, there's so much joy and you look at the child and, and you love the child. And for them and their tradition, as God held it for, for you know, seven days, you're, you're looking at this baby, isn't this so, so wonderful? And then on the eighth day, smack dab right in front of your face, you perform this act and it's a reminder to you that yes, even that child, though is just like all of us that there is sin that resides that needs to be cut out that sin is in us and needs to be removed so this joyous thing also becomes a very somber thing for the people of God we've lost sight of some of this but praise God that this was something that's under the old covenant under the old testament law this is not something that's required of God's people as we're going to see in a minute but listen Christianity has always called it like it is the scriptures call it like it is our deepest problem is sin. It indwells all of us. And circumcision reminded the people of God about that. But then finally this, circumcision served to remind God's people that the seed of Abraham would bring deliverance. That it was through the seed of Abraham that deliverance would, would come. Because they knew that full and complete obedience was necessary. They knew that they couldn't ultimately do it. And so circumcision pointed to the need of the depravity and the cleansing need that they had for sin. But praise be to God that in the covenant that God made with Abraham, he said that through you and through your descendants, one day all the earth will be blessed. It's through you that the deliverer is going to, to come. And so that sign of the covenant that you carry with you in your male reproductive organ is literally a reminder that it's, it's through the seed that I will produce that your cleansing and deliverance will one day take place. In Romans 4, 11, we read this. He, Abraham, received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith. Faith in what? Faith in what was to come. Faith in the, in the promise of God that a deliverer would come through his, his seed. And so when you read this, what could be just a, a fast verse in Luke 2.21 where it says that they took Jesus on the eighth day and they circumcised him, you can just read that and say, yeah, that's what the Jews did, but why did they do it? They did it for all of these reasons. But then that begs the question, and we still haven't got to the one which I wanna, want us to consider, which is why did Jesus go through with this? Why did Jesus allow himself to experience this when he was the promised one, when he was the one who was going to do all of these things? Well, in one sense, you could say he didn't have a choice. He was a baby, to which I would say, oh, come on. He's God in the flesh. If, if he wanted to, he could have, you know, he could have told Joseph and Mary, hey, you know that one thing? Let's not do that, okay? Like, he, there were lots of things. But he chose to do this, and here's the reason why. Everything Jesus Christ did and experienced, and by the way, this is at the very bottom of your notes, okay, if you're looking for it. Everything Jesus Christ did and experienced displayed his perfect obedience to God and his identification with humanity. Everything that Jesus Christ experienced and everything that Jesus Christ did displayed his perfect obedience to God and identification with humanity. Church, God said that this was part of his law. God said this is what must be done to every male born into the home of a Jewish father and mother. And so Jesus Christ allowed himself to experience not just the humility of infancy, but to experience the humility of having someone perform this upon him. Why? Well, Galatians 4, 4 through 5 tells us, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Jesus had to do this. He had to be 
perfectly obedient to God the Father for us. If the law required it, Jesus had to fulfill it. He couldn't escape it. He couldn't skirt around it. As I said at his birth, why was he born to such humble parents? Why was he born in such humble circumstances? It was so that Jesus could display perfect obedience to the Father without anyone looking at him and saying, you took advantages that others had. It was easier for you, Jesus, to obey God's law and to do those things. Jesus said, no, I did it all. In fact, Hebrews 2.17 says this. This is profound, church. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. What's being said there is Jesus went through everything that was required of us. He lived the life that we were supposed to have lived perfect obedience to the Father. He did this for you and for me. He did what we should have done and he did it perfectly. No shortcuts, no shortcuts. If he didn't identify with us, then he couldn't have, number one, been the perfect lamb who was sacrificed for your sin and my sin. And number two, he couldn't give you his righteous record. So he could forgive you of your sins, but to be adopted into God's family, to be accepted as one of his children, you would have to be as righteous as God's son. How can you be as righteous as God's son? He has to give you his righteousness. Do you see, Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly for you. When I think about Philippians chapter two, we keep coming back to this. It says that he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. But now do you understand Philippians two a little bit better? When it says that Jesus humbled himself, I want you to picture God coming as a baby, and you're like, oh, what humility. But then God allowing himself to be circumcised. You want to talk about humility. This is what God did for you to live in perfect obedience to the law. And and it doesn't stop there, church. In, In fact, it goes on. And I'm going to fly through these verses here. You see, not only do they come and they circumcise Jesus on the eighth day, but then something else happens. Look at verse 22. Here we see further obedience of Mary and Joseph, but then further identification of Jesus with humanity. Verse 22. And when the time came for their purification, notice it says, and when the time came for whose purification? Their purification. According to what? The law of Moses. They brought him, that is Jesus, to the Jerusalem to present him to the Lord as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of dirtle doves or two young pigeons. So first Mary and Joseph obey God in naming Jesus, Jesus. Then they obey God in having him circumcised. But then according to these verses, they don't just have him circumcised on the eighth day. They take Jesus to the temple, what would be 40 days after his birth, to ultimately perform everything that you see here. See, Leviticus 12 tells us that a woman who has given birth, when she gives birth, she's considered unclean before the Lord. And that in order for her to be considered clean, she would have to present herself to the Lord after 40 days. She would come into uh, the temple and make a sacrifice and she would then be considered clean. Now, some people would, have, would ask questions like, that seems a bit you know, harsh and stuff. You, know? <laughs> you give birth to a baby, that's hard enough. But then you're like, oh, by the way, honey, you're unclean. Like, doesn't seem like the nicest thing to necessarily do, but when you understand it in the context, again, like with circumcision, now this is going to be really hard to accept, but maybe not. Maybe you're like, no, I totally get it. You see, the thing that we continue to fail to see is that God is holy and we are not. We're not good. We're not... Before the Lord, there's his perfect righteous standard and then there's disobedience. And when a child was born, and the reason why a woman was considered unclean, while circumcision was a sign of God's promise, when a woman gave birth to a child, God's people understood that she gave birth to a sinner. 
that from her very womb came forth not someone who is perfect and angelic, but was nonetheless one more just like her. And so having given birth to one who was itself unclean, made the woman herself unclean. And so that is why she would have to go and make a sacrifice on behalf of her and on behalf of the child because that was a That was a clear testimony to the people of God that yes, wonderful, children are a blessing from the Lord, but nonetheless, unless something covers the sin of the mother and covers the sin of the child, they are under the judgment of God. See, today we've lost sight of some of these things. If you were a Jew, it was up in your face all the time that God was holy and you were not. Even in the beautiful thing of the birth of a child, you're performing circumcision, which was reminding you that, that you need to be cleansed of your sins and that a redeemer is going to come. And then when you gave birth to a child, you went and you made a sacrifice to the Lord in the temple. Why? To remind you that you were a sinner in need of salvation and that the only thing that could cover the sinner was a sacrifice. And so Mary and Joseph, what do they do? They come in obedience to the word of God. And not only do they come in obedience to the word of God for their purification, that is for Mary and for, for Jesus, although Jesus was not himself a sinner. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to that in just a second. But notice they also came because God's law required that the firstborn child would be consecrated to the Lord. Exodus 3, 13, 2 says, Everyone who first comes out of the womb belongs to me. And so they understood that in the sacrifice for Jesus and in the dedication of Jesus, they were fulfilling what God required them to do. See, church, we read the, we read the story of Jesus' birth and we're just like, okay, great. I, you know, Jesus just, yeah, they did what they did. But we miss it. Jesus is allowing himself to experience all these things. His parents are walking in obedience to this because, as I said, he had to identify with us in every way. He had to perfectly obey the law for us because we fail to do so, church. And so Christ comes and he does these things for us, but it leads to this final question. The final question being, wait a second, Why are they making a sacrifice for Jesus? Well, isn't he the perfect spotless son of God? He is the perfect spotless son of God. He was the only person ever born for whom a sacrifice did not need to be made as a covering for sin. But instead, we look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, God's word clearly says it. For our sake... He made him to be sin who knew what? How much sin did he know? No sin. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Don't just ever read past these verses and skip on to the other things, but to consider when you read everything, church, that Jesus experienced, everything that he did was purposeful was intentional. And in the humility of this, Jesus went through all of these things because as this verse says, for our sake, for you, for me, so that we would not have to be under the judgment of God any longer, so that we wouldn't have to be enslaved to sin, so that we can have the power to walk in obedience as he walked in obedience through the Holy Spirit. God went through all of this so that we might become the what? Righteousness of God. Do not throw away, do not just set aside these little things because they're not little. What Jesus did starting from his birth all the way up to his crucifixion on the cross was all so that the law could be fulfilled so that today as we sit here in this place, we can look at one another. We can look up to the Lord and say, we are righteous in him. This is what you and I have received. And if you do not know Christ in this way, then I would invite you to know and experience a righteousness that was purchased for you, not just through his death on the cross, but through the perfect life that he 
lived. I put, put down this week, church, you're not doing more than or better than Jesus. You never will. But, but it's not about you and I living a life of obedience to God. Christianity is about you and I recognizing that we did not live the life that we should have lived before God, that we are under his judgment, but because of Jesus Christ, because he lived the life we should have lived, we now are not only spared the wrath of God, but we have the power to live in obedience to him. Praise the Lord for that, amen? Let's pray. Lord, we worship and adore you, and we say thanks be to your name, both now and forevermore, that you came down And when you came down, you experienced it and you went through it all so that through your life lived, Lord, we might become the righteousness of God. Thank you that the burden to fulfill the law has been fulfilled in Jesus. That when we walk in obedience, it's not so that we can come and make ourselves acceptable and presentable to you, but it's because it's the life you've now purchased for us to live. And that there's a freedom in that. Lord, help us walk in that joy. Help us walk in that power, Lord. And we just say thank you. And I pray, Lord, that my own life, that the life of my brothers and sisters here, Lord, that it would be marked by the humility of Jesus. If, if this is how our master has served us, oh Lord, may we never hesitate to look to serve one another in the same way. To the praise and glory of your name we ask it. And all God's people said, amen. Amen.